Hello um, to everyone joining us on this webinar. Um, we will get going very shortly. Um, we'll just give people a few minutes to dial in and join us. Um, in the meantime, it'd be great to get some insight into where people are joining us from. Um, so if you could use the chat function to kind of type in and let us know where you're joining us from, that would be great. We tend to have sort of a, a lot of attendees from our Australian capital cities, um, but we do get the occasion regional joiner or we do get a few international as well. So it'd be great if you can let us know where you're joining us from today. From Victoria, lovely, hello. Sydney, yeah, we're in Sydney as well. So myself and Martin are both in Sydney, hello. Hi everybody. Wollongong as well. So there's lots of uh, New South Wales, Sydney, Sydney. ACT, Goldie, we've got a good split today, Martin, a good mix of people joining us from across Australia. Excellent. And uh, all those places that you mentioned, they sound so far away at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> They do it's for so us beautiful. one day soon, one yeah. day soon. Yeah. Well, hello to everyone um, on the webinar. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, my name is Holly Baldwin and I'm delighted to be joined today by Martin Bass, um, who's gonna run us through just a short webinar on effective community and stakeholder engagement. Um, Martin's been working in this field for a number of years. We're very lucky to have him with us today. Um, he works with private companies as well as state and federal governments. Um, I know he's doing a lot of work at the moment out in Western New South Wales um, with community and stakeholder engagement over there. Um, this webinar will probably run for about 15 to 20 minutes content wise, and then we will do a short Q&A session. So please, 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 as we go along, if you have any questions, please pop them in either the Q&A or the chat function on your control panel, and we'll get to as many of those questions as we possibly can at the end. Um, without further ado, welcome, Martin. Hi, thanks, Holly, and hello, everybody. And, and uh, yes, as Holly said, welcome to this webinar. Um, and uh, as, as Holly said, I'm, uh, I've, I've been doing for the last 12 months or so a lot of work out in far western New South Wales uh, around, um, unfortunately, Wilcannia, poor old Wilcannia, um, which is why I'm not there at the moment. Nobody, nobody really can go in and out of there, but I just thought I'd share with you that the screen in the background there is the, um, the old, the now disused uh, solar array uh, at White Cliffs, uh, the opal, little opal mining town of White Cliffs in, um, in far western New South Wales. Um, and I've spent so much time there and I just, I never, I, I, I never tire of uh, looking at this uh, solar array that was built by the CSIRO back in, um, in the, I think it was the early 80s to, uh, to, to trial to see how uh, effective solar power would be at powering a town. And uh, it evidently this would be quite effective. Anyway, there you go, a little bit of trivia. Um, so yeah, what I wanted to do, I thought a, a good way to actually um, spend some time in this webinar is to look, uh, just consider some of the key ingredients um, uh, in, in good engagement. Um, and uh, also look at how the landscape is changing for uh, engagement practitioners. Um, because we definitely, I think, do need to take stock of these kind of things. What, what you know, what what do we need to think about in terms of a, a you know changing world, and in particularly in, in um, reference to different technologies. And uh, I'll explain that as it comes to, as we come to that section. But then I also want to spend some time talking about the um, what what happens. What are, what are the potential consequences of of you know if we do not if we ignore the need to undertake not just engagement but good sincere and good sound engagement. So that's where I want to actually take us over the next 15 or 20 minutes. And then, um, as Holly said, we'll have uh, some time for questions and please throw all the questions at me that you like. Um, just uh, very, very briefly, my background, I have a very long standing background in, um, in local government. Um, and uh, I have been working for myself since about 2007. I work and um, very closely aligned with local and state government agencies um, and um, have uh, mainly around the uh, the community and stakeholder engagement field and also uh, sort of strategic planning, long-term planning, community planning, that sort of thing. 
Um, and those two areas, of course, engagement and community planning go very much hand in hand. You can't do one without the other. Um, okay, so let's just have a look first at um, what might be the key ingredients, I think, to um, good uh, engagement. The first absolutely is that is a good, a, a strong set of principles, and I can't uh, overstate the the necessity for engagement practitioners and agencies as a whole to actually consider um, and think about and and develop a good set of principles for engagement because principles, a strong set of principles, um, are what ensures that engagement is conducted um, properly and ethically uh, with with uh, due respect for um, not only your stakeholders and communities and, and such, but also the kind of outcomes uh, from your engagement processes and also in your project work um, that, that uh, everybody wants to see. Um, so uh, there are, I, I kind of, um, the way that I actually approach principles myself are, are I'm looking at examining principles on two levels. Firstly, there is a set of principles, ways um, that are these overarching guiding principles that that uh, agencies and and practitioners need to bear in mind, which is basically comes back to why do we do this? Why should we do this? And why do we need to do it well? Um, secondly, there is a, a a set of principles I think which are equally as strong around the design, development, implementation of engagement. Um, we do need principles, I think, to guide us in our development of, um, of um, uh, engagement, our engagement practices and engagement projects and such. And that set of principles, I think, when we actually develop them and consider them, really kind of, they, they sort of minimise the chances that our engagement just becomes a box ticking exercise, which all too often I've seen that, that happen and I've seen it go drastically wrong when when you know when it's clear that that, that engagement be, becomes something just a, a, a ticker box so that a project can be de deluded um, and that's where things tend to go wrong we also i think need to um, engage in some very sound planning uh, around our engagement again um, all too often i have um, witnessed um, sort of bad outcomes um, emanating from engagement that has not been properly planned out and thought through. Sorry, the one that I actually missed out there completely, stakeholder identification. I went straight on to planning. Um, and the thing about it is that, what, and I mean, that's, it, that's sort of uh, timely to actually see that because stakeholder identification is one of the areas that is most lacking in planning, doing a thorough job of really truly identifying stakeholders. Um, and, and having a good think through who they are and, and you know, um, how we need to actually make contact with them. And the issue there becomes very much one of, you know, if we don't do, and, and I'm sure anyone, any, anyone amongst you who has actually had any involvement in, in um, engagement, and this is a big thing, particularly in local government, um, is that we, we come to rely on the, 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 the the people that always come forward, you know, there's always a group of people who act, who are actually keen to get involved and they're kind of passionate about community, they're passionate about uh, particular issues, they want to be heard, um, you know, they may have been a councillor, uh, you know, as an elected councillor previously, you know, there are all sorts of reasons that motivate people, but there are uh, what, what I... Um, what I uh, call the usual suspects who, who always bring themselves forward. The, the whole issue there is that if we rely on the usual suspects to actually come forward and form our engagement base, we can in some ways tick a box and say, yes, we got, you know, people, people did come to, um, you know, we did get stakeholders involved in our engagement, but it, it's nowhere near the job that we need uh, to have done. And engaging, uh, sorry, identifying stakeholders is, is an absolutely critical part of that. It's only once we identify our stakeholders that we can understand you know, how to actually um, uh, go and, and get them, make contact with them, and bring them to the table. Um, that is just one area of the um, of planning that we actually need to consider. We need to consider so much in planning in terms of 
where engagement fits in an overall process. And if we look at, at engagement that needs to happen across the life of perhaps a, a project, um, uh, we need to actually look at, you know, where does engagement belong within the life of that project? Um, and so planning, you know, developing a good uh, engagement plan will enable us to actually consider that. Methodologies is, um, is, is another one. There are a couple of things that really need to be considered around engagement methodologies. Firstly, depending on how big the project is that, that we're engaging on, um, I would always recommend that, that we, we use more than one methodology because often when we limit ourselves or confine ourselves to one single methodology, we are only able to attract the people who are open to to that method and then just to explain that if we run workshops or shop fronts or that sort of thing we're really going to engage people who might be able to um, actually get the time to attend um, those kind of meetings or uh, take time out from work or family or whatever to actually be part of that of course there's a lot of people who can do that um, who, who will be able to do it and 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 believe that that, that that the you know the project or the issue that's being engaged on is important enough to take that time out. But there will always be people who who either cannot or will not um, get involved in actually you know, going somewhere and being part of something. And therefore, in those kind of uh, situations, we might look at um, using a survey to uh, that that is um, perhaps um, accessible online or uh, you know, in whatever form on social media, that sort of thing to actually um, attract those people or enable people to, to um, participate. So, so the whole kind of um, our, our, what we're actually trying to do when we in, in our planning and when we engage in general is to have the broadest uh, and the farthest reach that we possibly can have, to bring as many people as appropriate as we can into the fold to be part of what we're doing. Now, the, and the thing is, it's very easy to say, it's very difficult to do, which is why it comes back to all these, um, all these, these areas that we really need to think about, about identifying stakeholders, about doing the planning, about the methodologies such as well. What methods are going to enable most people to have, you know, the, the best say or the, the you know, the, um, sort of the, the meaningful input in what we're trying to do. Um, another point there is um, is innovation, and I raise. I mean, innovation is a term that is um, possibly overused, has been overused. But I um, I did want to actually mention it here purely because I, most of the agencies, when I <clears throat> talk through these kind of issues with um, agencies during training sessions and the like, one of the most common things I find is that. Um, People say that they use the methodologies, particularly that they've always used, that they know how to use and that they're comfortable with. And I, I get that. I absolutely understand that because engagement is, is more often than not, not our core business. It's not what we do. So one of the things that the, you know, um, uh, that I find as well is that, uh, that you know, people might be, um, you know, environmental planners, um, traffic engineers, um, you know, uh, uh, infrastructure designers, and so on. Well, those are, those people also have to be engagement practitioners, and this is what you know drives people back to using methodologies that they know and trust, it's because often they haven't got time or the or the headspace to actually think. Well, how can we do this differently? How can we, you know, test the test the water with other methodologies and perhaps see what improvements we can make? Often people kind of uh, uh, are, are um, confined for many reasons, external reasons, to we'll just need to do what we've always done because it's for us, it's, it's the most efficient and effective thing how it works. But innovation, when we have the opportunity, is still very, um, uh, very important to actually look at, at doing at, at you know other methods of engagement. And in in the um, in the course that I actually run. Uh, with Informa, I do actually um, concentrate on a number of um, quite innovative methods of engagement, and they always elicit very interesting reactions. Some of them people have tried or have witnessed, um, 
but I remember in my own personal um, journey through a sort of engagement and my own personal experience in, in being a practitioner, uh, I was actually just happened upon a methodology uh, once that someone else introduced me to that asked me to come along and, uh, in, um, in, uh, with, a, with an engagement thing about a water uh, catchment area. And the methodology that they used was so unbelievably eye-opening and, and effective, and I could see immediately what their benefits were, that I actually took that method and adapted it and uh, and used it th for the next three or four years. It was pretty much all I did working in, in New South Wales local government with the arrival of a, a new piece of legislation back in 2010-11. Uh, and it was just, you know, it was amazing. So if we open our, our eyes and open our minds to kind of innovation and different ways of doing things, we will often see uh, some fantastic possibility. Um, and also resources, very, very important to actually consider that if our agencies that, that we work with don't um, uh, support <clears throat> engagement with the requisite resources, then it becomes all the more difficult and um, our, our outcomes become, um, you know, all the more sort of touch and go, uncertain. So they're just some of the key ingredients around um, engagement. What I want to actually talk about now <clears throat> briefly is um, changes in, in the landscape, the engagement landscape over the years. And I'm sure that, again, those of you who are either involved as practitioners or have, have any, you know, been, been a party to any engagement, seen any engagement um, uh, happen, will be aware of these, um, uh, these issues. So, Firstly, the landscape has changed, I think, in regard to agency transparency and accountability. Over the last 10 or 15 years, um, public and private sector agencies have really um, had to become work in, in, put it this way, work in a, in a, in a landscape of, of much greater accountability and much greater transparency. Private sector agency is, if you look at it, shareholders and, and um, you know, um, all sorts of things, the ACCC and lots of agencies uh, uh, and processes and so on are around to ensure good practices and good principles um, apply to how, you know, we do business in the private sector and the public sector alike. So transparency and accountability is one <clears throat> that I have seen over the last as say, 10 or more years um, that has really been front and centre in how we, you know, how any agency does what it does. Um, uh, secondly, communication channels, I call this communication channels, I take in media, um, so, so mass media, the reach of, of, the, uh, of the mass media is, is just, uh, you know, getting further and further and further all the time. And, and it's very interesting to watch the situation unfolding with COVID in, in uh, Wilcannia, for those of you who are aware of it, the far western New South Wales town, which has, uh, which is largely um, um, uh, Aboriginal population. Um, and I have been working out there for the last 12 months um, very closely with the uh, Aboriginal communities in White, in, uh, sorry, in Wilcannia and surrounding towns. And very interesting to see the information that's coming out there now with my, you know, I have a lot of connections, made a lot of friends, done a lot of work out there, spent a lot of time there. And some of the information that's coming out is through mass media is is quite accurate and some of it is not um but what it actually shows me is that you know the media is 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 the reach is getting further and the scrutiny uh, around media is getting uh, is is sort of not not there as it used to be uh, around me the, the the content the actual messages and so from an agency point of view that means we need to be careful we need to be very careful um, that what we're doing is is you know, the right thing to do, that we are doing it with integrity, that we're involving people, we're including people in our decision making, in our, in our um, the direction we're heading in as, as agencies that are delivering services, uh, you know, selling things, whatever it might be, uh, that we're acting with integrity um, and, and the perception is that we are accountable, uh, that, that our operations and our decision making are transparent and so on. Because because mass media um, is is, uh, is is ever present, you know, to a much greater extent than it used to be, as uh, well as uh, social media. And social media is now, I mean, look, well, you know, I say this in my training courses, suffice to say that the Arab Spring 
the whole transformation of the uh, of the uh, the Middle East when that started started on Facebook, uh, and that is pretty much all the evidence that we need to consider when we are when we're looking at the power of social media. And one of the interesting now I, I don't delve too deeply to social media in in uh, my training because I don't. Um, I believe social media is a, a good tool for communication. I don't believe it's a really it's an, it, it is a good tool for engagement. Um, it is one tool, but it cannot be the only one. Um, but anyway, look, we can have as much discussion as you want to have around this because I know everybody has different experience and everybody has uh, different ideas about it. But I think social media is something that um, many agencies are still learning how to actually come to terms with it and how to use it properly. Mm -hmm. Um, the third point there, um, changes in the in the landscape, is I call it entitlement. Um, you know, when we actually talk about concepts of people's entitlement, people are entitled, it's, it's, it's often in a negative context, context. And I want to say at the outset, it, this is not in um, a negative context, but uh, because, but what, what I'm, what I actually want to say here is that people, um, consumers, be they rate payers, be they taxpayers, be they uh, purchases of goods and services and so on from the private sector, uh, are, are increasingly aware of their, their entitlements um, that, uh, you know, to, to fairness, to equity, uh, to access to services, to, um, you know, goods and services that, that you know, are reliable, that work, we, we, that, that, you know, are delivered and provided as promised. And that sense of entitlement is growing ever stronger and people have a, a sense of their own a greater sense of their own power to actually speak out if uh, what they're getting is less than what they were promised or what they were told about and this is something where we need to be very careful as well so the reason i raise these issues is that engagement is a very very powerful tool in addressing all of these issues it engagement addresses the whole is a powerful tool in address in addressing our transparency and accountability in addressing people's entitlement because what we're doing when we engage properly is we're bringing them properly into the fold and saying participate be part of our decision making our direction setting and the like um, and it's also addressing the communication um, the uh, issues because we are providing people with direct opportunities to to be with us and not relying, and, and we are giving messages more directly, rather than relying on mass media, social media, that sort of thing, to actually interpret our messages and um, and and, and um, disseminate them as they see fit. So, so there are just a few issues around how the landscape's changing. The final thing I want to address um, is the consequences of poor engagement, and and I'll go through these very very quickly. Um, when we actually don't engage properly or when we don't engage at all, the kind of things that we face to varying degrees and depending on the agencies that we're with, we work for and so on. We absolutely can look at things like a loss of trust um, from our consumers or our, um, our customers, um, taxpayers, ratepayers, whoever they may be, um, because what they see from the outside is decisions being made and, and directions being set that, that, and they're not part of it. You know, and they're... Um, uh, and, you know, the, the, the whole COVID situation at the moment, I think, is testament to that. And it, I'm not saying there's anything else that could be, can necessarily be done in such a tearing hurry. But when you, I live in one of these uh, Sydney areas of concern and a whole of the decisions get made about, uh, you know, the way that we live and the way that we have to live and so on. And after a while, you can see the quiet around that growing, you know, and, and, people arbitrary decisions get made to protect people and their health and so on and so, and, and i say again I'm, I'm, I'm not saying that it can be done or should be done in this situation any differently uh that's a just that's a separate discussion but but what happens is that um it, this, you know decisions that are made in isolation will always compromise trust you know in, in agencies the second one is conflict and hostility again if people see decisions being made and things happening in their um, and they're alienated from that um, and, and they haven't been involved and so on and their outcomes they don't like, then that gives rise often to considerable hostility and conflict. And I have 
all manner of horror stories to share with you. Uh, uh, not now, but at, uh, yeah, certainly in the training, we certainly run through a um, whole heap of stories and we share a lot of stories around this. Um, it, it, again, the impact on efficiencies uh, can be huge. We do often have to uh, st stop the clock go back to the beginning and restart processes. And I, I have been witness to this involving millions of dollars uh, of either wasted money or wasted project um, uh, you know, funds and so on, uh, having to reinvent, redevelop, recommence projects, redesign things. Um, so engagement is very, very much these days linked to organizational or agency efficiencies. Um, a lack of engagement or improper engagement can also deny us opportunities that we would otherwise have. It, it, it would deny us some, you know, greater thinking in terms of the people we involve, all manner of things. But engagement does present a host of opportunities in terms of how we do what we do and the outcomes we're looking for. Um, and well, and the next point there is inappropriate project outcomes. Um, and, and, and again, all of these are interlinked. I mean, inappropriate project outcomes can most definitely lead to inefficiencies, um, greater expenditure that's required, waste of money, waste of time, and so on. And a whole lot of legacy issues. If we don't do it now, we set up. If we don't do it right now, the relationships and the engagement, we set up legacy issues for those uh, in the future if in, within our organisation because we, we actually act either passively or actively to diminish trust, to, to diminish relationships or, or uh, uh, you know, let relationships, uh, um, uh, you know, go, we ignore them or we, 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 we don't give them due regard. And that leaves a host of legacy issues for people are, who, who will, um, you know, um, tread in our footsteps afterwards to actually pick up and, and then have to work at repairing and addressing um, because we haven't paid attention to it now. Okay, I am worded out. I think we're pretty much coming up to time and we do want to um, leave some time, time for questions now. So what I'm going to do is hand back to Holly uh, to, uh, to take it from here and uh, just talk a little bit about the, the course and, uh, and then we'll take some questions. Lovely. Well, thank you so much, Martin, for that. It was definitely very insightful with a few tidbits that people can take away. Um, yeah, please do stay on the line and use that chat function if you have any questions. We'll get to Q&A very shortly. Um, we do have um, the Effective Community and Stakeholder Engagement course coming up with Martin in September. Um, don't worry too much about taking all this information down, as we will send out an email to all attendees post-webinar. Um, we're delighted, though, to offer people on the line today a 10% discount, um, so please do get in touch with us. You can email us at training at um, or we'll obviously have all our contact details in the email. Uh, Martin does also work with us to kind of customise courses and we can run them in-house. So if you have a team who you think would benefit and you might want to look at some customised training, again, let us know and we will be in touch. Um, so yes, Q&A. We have had somebody um, say some great nuggets here. Will the webinar recording be made available? Um, yes, it will. So yes, we will send over an email in the coming days with a recording and some more information as well. So thank you very much for that question. Um, I have had one come in here privately, Martin, that says... I'm new to engagement and a lot of our planning documents and templates were for the pre-COVID face-to-face world. Do you have any um, recommendations on how to look at this from a virtual perspective? Yeah, look, uh, not as such, um, not, not at the moment because the COVID landscape um, has changed so much and so quickly. So when you actually consider what happened last year, um, the first half of last year, we, you know, the world just basically stopped. Um, uh, for, for the first, probably from what, February to early March to around about June, July, I think, as, as far as I recall, then everything opened up. Um, and it's only with the 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 the, the um, this Delta strain rearing its ugly head that we actually now um, are kind of having to think about this all again. Um, so, look, yeah, that what that means is that no, I don't. I I certainly haven't had any um, time or space to actually um, be thinking at all in in the about you know in uh, you know life and engagement in 
in, inside the, the COVID in the in the COVID room. Um, but it, it is probably, it, it may well be a question that we need to consider. I think the way that people are talking at the moment, though, very much is about just, you know, the unlocking um, and, and, you know, being life in an unlocked world once, the, um, once we get vaccinated and such. So, look, suffice to say there that, that no, that there really hasn't, I haven't had personally an opportunity to do that. I've been very, very busy out in the far west of New South Wales over the last um, 12 months, as Holly said, and, and it's really only in the last couple of months that it's it, this COVID situation has impacted and everything is, is on hold because the, I mean, you know, technology looking at this environment, uh, at the, the COVID environment, when you go, when, you know, working with a, a community out in the far west, they cannot, um, uh, they just can't manage any engagement online. There is, the telecommunications out there are bad. And as one of the things that you need to think about in terms of any online engagement is who are you cutting in and who are you cutting out with your engagement? Because still not everybody um, actually has, either has access to or or desires to use or is able to use um, this kind of technology, um, and and people, you know, there's a myriad of people who um, who who just don't have access uh, to to this, and you know, some of the people that we may uh, consider are kind of people with disability, um, people who are um, uh, very limited in terms of of um, personal finances and so on, if they just can't afford the technology. Um, other people from non-English speaking backgrounds. So there are a host of new things that need to be considered if we look at this kind of potential for online, this kind of online engagement, we actually need yeah. to give huge consideration to the kind of people who we're cutting out by doing that. But anyway, look, big subject for discussion for sure. Yeah, definitely. Thanks, Martin. Um, the next one says, you only briefly mentioned about developing a good engagement plan. What would you include in this? Look, there's a whole, um, there's, a, there's, there's sort of six or seven um, different points. And, and you know, what I encourage people to do is use my template, if you like, which is just basically a list, um, to, um, to, 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 to develop your own. Um, but, but the kind of thing that I'm, I, I'm the kind of um, uh, planning that I, or the kind of points I take into account in engagement planning are things like, you know, the, the, we start at the end. So basically when we set an engagement, when we develop an engagement plan, the very first thing we do is figure out what do we need to walk away with from our engagement. And, and starting at the end, I know that's a cheesy throwaway line, so we start at the end and everything falls into place. But this, it really is the case where if we start by, by uh, considering what outcomes do we want from our engagement, what do we need to actually walk away with from our engagement events, that, that sets the direction for where we're going. So we actually acknowledge the engagement outcomes that we need. Then we then we can start to piece together. All right, who needs? Who do we need to come to the table? Our stakeholder identification, um, and, and then we can. There are various methods of stakeholder ID that we uh, that we need to kind of use and engage in uh, ourselves to actually figure out who we need to bring to the table. Um, then we start to once we um, do the stakeholder ID, we can start to consider. Um, any of the any potential baggage, any issues, any agendas that, that that our stakeholders might bring to the room, bring to the table with them, because we actually need to take stock of them as well and be prepared for what people want to talk about as well. How do we actually include that? Or if they want to bring any conflict or hostility in the room, we need to be prepared for that. And it's only identifying and understanding our stakeholders that we are actually able to come to terms with, or we're able to think about. Mm, okay. They're going to be happy, but they're not going to be happy. And here's how we need to prepare ourselves. Um, and not prepare to be combative and defensive, but prepare to accommodate everybody, you know, prepare to hear what people have to say. Um, but, but we do not want to feel like we're being blindsided or ambushed. Um, and half the time that we do feel blindsided and ambushed in our engagement, we've actually brought that on ourselves because we have not given these kind of things due consideration. <clears throat> and they're there, whilst they're there to be considered. Um, then the next stage is, um, is considering what methodologies, once we've identified our stakeholders, then we can start to 
to determine what methodologies we can actually use to give people the best opportunities to participate. Um, and then once we choose methodologies, we can do all the practicalities of the timing, the location, the infrastructure that we need around it. Do we need it? And I mean, look, I'm, you know, I've done a lot of engagement in small, very small rural communities where we do have to think about things like heating in little community halls. We have to think about bacon and egg roll breakfasts for farmers who come along for our 7 a.m. Um, engagement in the middle of a community hall in the middle of nowhere sort of thing you know we have to think about all manner of things practicalities around it um, and, and an inventory of things that we need to prepare and we need to bring um, as well and and then that moves through to you know if we work on a basis of continuous improvement in our engagement we need to figure out if if we're going to evaluate what we're doing and if we do want to evaluate it how we're going to evaluate it and that in itself needs consideration so they're just some of the steps that we need to actually consider in our engagement planning Wonderful. Thanks, Martin. It's a huge topic planning. I mean, we could, you could probably speak for, for hours on it, but thank you for giving a, a kind of overview of that. Do. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> the next one says, what are your thoughts on the following additional criteria? Um, and then it says timing of messaging, when to communicate a message. In addition to having a set of principles, you need clear objectives around what you expect to achieve as an outcome of stakeholder engagement. So, so timing, yes, timing is most important because uh, timing is critical because we want people to actually understand what we're trying to achieve, but we do not want to, um, we've got to figure out who we're trying to, again, it, so much comes down to identifying our stakeholders because we want to kind of capture people, capture people's interest and attention and, and for them to see, oh, there's an invitation to attend or to sign in or, you know, fill out a survey or whatever. Um, we want to give them enough time to actually fill, you know, fit this in in their schedule, but not so much lead time they actually wind up forgetting. So timing is most important in the um, in the whole thing. And um, sorry, what was the question about messaging? The the second part of that. Oh, Holly, you're muted. Oh, yeah. It said, in addition to have a set of principles, you need yep. clear objectives around what you expect to achieve as an outcome ah, of stakeholder yes, engagement. Absolutely. Look, um, well, in that, I would simply come back to the that, that being the first point in the engagement planning. Um, look, engagement, I think, is is born of, you know, other than the principles, which, you know, these high level principles around the, the um, you know, why agencies should engage and why they should engage with integrity and then principles around implementation. Engagement is, I think, is... Um, it needs good practical thinking. So when we're actually thinking about the objectives, build that into our planning, because it's only once we actually recognize or discuss or bring to the surface, what are we trying to achieve, the objectives, that we can then plan everything else. Then, you know, it's only when we're actually looking at the objectives that we start to actually be able to think about who, who the stakeholders are that we need to bring into the fold for this. Um, and, and so many of the other, other kind of planning decisions that we need to actually and planning kind of steps and, and decisions that we need to actually go through. So yes, objectives are, are, are critical, but our, you see, a set of principles doesn't necessarily, well, won't change. Objectives will change. Object, object, the objectives need to be adaptable um, to, to the job we're trying to do. To, to the to the actual the project we're trying to develop the service we're trying to design uh, that sort of thing so keep your objectives um, adaptable and flexible and and apply your objectives thinking you're thinking around what objectives you're trying to achieve keep that to each individual project otherwise uh, objectives is, is perhaps just another name for for principles uh, you know high level principles because we could sort of describe you know transparency and accountability as an objective. But it's also a principle, so um, you know, it might be a tomato tomato kind of situation um, in terms of like you know, if I describe principles as as um, uh, you know the why agencies engage uh, at the highest level as you know maintaining transparency and accountability, um, uh, you know, um, efficiency in, in in agency outcomes and that sort of thing, then they are all so objective. So, so yeah, it's a lot of it's about language. 
Yeah, that was a that was a great question. Timing is is so critical, especially when it comes to messaging. So thank you um, for that question. Um, we don't at the moment have any more questions, and we probably do have time for one or two more. So if anyone does have any questions, please do pop them now into the chat function, or you can also use the Q and A. Um, we've probably got, as I mentioned, a, a few more minutes. So if you do have any questions, please do pop them in now. I, I'll just say while we're while we're waiting that um, the, the, the the timing. I hope that what I was, um, you know, my comments around timing there was was what you um, uh, what what the question uh, what the question was was looking for. Um, timing is is something that. Um, you know, I mean, there's there's timing considerations in terms of the messaging, absolutely. Um, and and I come back to it can't be too early, it can't be too late, for all those uh, reasons that I went through. Um, but also timing of engagement in in projects. I'll just actually throw in a little bit here. Holly, do let me know if there are questions that are coming in. But otherwise, let me um let me say that um, timing of engagement uh, as a little rule of thumb. I time engagement in, in the life, through the life of a project, I time engagement when, when any of the, 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 the core of the project changes, the trans, trans, you know, changes form, if you like. So, so for example, writing a community plan or developing a community plan, you engage with community to get their essence of their priorities, their, their uh, you know, sense of, of you know what they want in their future and their aspirations for their communities and that sort of thing. So we get you know hundreds, if not thousands, of comments from a, a great number of great many people who have participated in that kind of engagement. We then need to kind of crystallize, we need to look for common themes, we need to crystallize that information and condense it to to develop sort of representative statements, if you like. And, and that is the opportunity, or that's the next opportunity for engagement. We need, it's not just an opportunity, it's beholden on us to sort of go back to people and say, all right, so, you know, here are all the comments that you made, hundreds and thousands of them, is how we have condensed and crystallized them. And here are the representative statements that we have actually developed that represent what you've said. Is this accurate? Have we represented your thoughts, your ideas, and your comments accurately? That's the next time you go to 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 engage with people. So each step of the way, you take a project, you de de develop a project, and such based on engagement. When you transform anything around that project, that is the time to go back to people and say, "Are we on track here? Are we doing this right? Is this what you said?" You know, so on. So just just a little rule of thumb to think about. Awesome. Thanks, Martin. We did get another question come in. Um, yep. So it says, what's your thoughts on formal versus informal engagement activities? Okay. Look, that is a great question. That is a great, that is a top question because I, it's a dilemma for me all the time. Uh, what we need to actually do is we need to take our cues from the people who are, who we're working with, our, our, our stakeholders and all communities and such. So if we are engaging, for example, with, um, with um, other government and non-government agencies, for example, it's probably, would probably err on the side of formality. And, and I'm interpreting here, I must say, what you are, um, you know, what your, your, your the meaning of, uh, of formality here, but I would probably dress professionally and I would probably, you know, yeah, but, um, uh, make presentations, uh, you know, pretty high level and so on. Mixing with community is a very different thing, though, and, and other stakeholders, um, because you do not want to either scare them and you do not want to give them an idea that you are so kind of alienated from them that you're from a completely different planet. So if they turn up in kind of, um, you know, their weekend clothes, if you run a Saturday and a Saturday afternoon, and you turn up with a, in a certain tie, most times that's going to look out of place. So informality, I think the high side of informality is 
is what we're after. So, for example, when I when I when I started engaging out in uh, in Wilcannia and Menindee and so on with the communities out there, so largely Aboriginal communities and farming communities. So they turn up in you know in a myriad of different um, 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 clothing and outfits and so on. And I said to the uh, the 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 general manager of the council there, how do you want us to dress? What is appropriate here? I took my cues from somebody there who was who I was firstly from who I was working for, and secondly, who was familiar with the you know how how to actually do this. And he said, look, you know, no tie, which is good because I don't own one. Um, no, just just you know, smart, casual, that sort of thing. You know, well, the first time we went out and and I did that, I I did the smart, casual thing, and I felt like I was okay. I was sort of accepted and so on. The, once the relationships developed. I felt much more comfortable about being in, you know, jeans and and a shirt and and um, you know boots or sneakers or something, you know. Never t-shirt, never thongs, never shorts. That's 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 out of that's that's um you know can't do that. Um, but but you know coming closer to the people that you're working with in terms of that level of informality you know you always sort of need to slightly be on the higher side of it i think um but i don't think there's you know just when we're working certainly with communities uh you know drop suit and tie it's, it's just it's too alienating and it's also it's sort of like it works on the same principles as why you know the reasons why judges wear their uh you know their their their, their um their, their fluffy sheep uh, uh, woolen hats is is to actually give them separation and authority and and we do not want that we want we want to look presentable and we want to be presentable in our language in our appearance that sort of thing but we do not want to be scary we don't want to be intimidating so i hope that answers your question uh, but but in overall my the strongest point there is take your cues from the people that you're engaging with uh, um, and uh, and be sort of pre pretty much at that level at their level, but but I would st stop way short of if they turn up in t-shirt and shorts and thongs. I, I would I would advise not to do that. But it, there is a sign that you can be pretty sort of smart, casual uh, jeans and jeans and a, and, a, and a comfortable shirt, <laughs> that sort of thing. So anyway, I hope that hits the mark for you. Lovely. Thank you so much, uh, Martin. We haven't had any other questions come in, so I think we probably will leave it there. Um, yep. Thank you so, so much to everybody on the line for joining us today. It's been great to have you here and thanks for being so interactive with questions as well. Um, we will send out, as we mentioned, an email with some more information and a recording of the webinar. Um, but the biggest thanks of the day obviously goes to Martin. Thank you so much for your insight you. and joining us today. It's been a pleasure. Lovely. Thanks, everybody. Wonderful. Thanks all. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.